Um, thank you so much for, uh, for being here and for giving me the, the opportunity to speak with all of you. It really is a great privilege for me. I want to thank you all for the hospitality that you have shown me, particularly my friend Emre, um, Ibru and Arzu as well in the Foundation's Development Program. Uh, and just in general, I have found Istanbul to be a wonderful cosmopolitan place. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here. This is my first time uh, being in Turkey and, and being in Istanbul. Um, I uh, have gotten to know Sabanji's program fairly well over the last few months uh, through my correspondence with Emre and then my last couple of days on campus. And I'll be here for still another week and so I will get to know your university much better. Um, but I have to say I am so excited by the friendship that we have between Columbia University where I oversee our core curriculum a program that we've had since the year 1919. Um, and our, our partnership, our collaboration with Sabanji, and I'm really excited to see the direction in which this collaboration will go and how it will develop over the years. Uh, one of the figures I'll be speaking about today and again tomorrow at the Istanbul uh, Center for Policy, the Policy Center, right, uh, uh, it is John Dewey, uh, philosopher, uh, one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century, American philosopher who taught at Columbia University for 25 years. And uh, as I'll be describing today and again tomorrow, uh, Dewey was very much a philosopher of education. And he believed that education uh, was a crucial part of a thriving democracy. And he understood democracy to be a way of life, not simply a form of government. Uh, but I think if John Dewey were here today and he saw what you were doing at Sabanji, he would very much approve. I think that, that you are doing exactly uh, what he believed in. So I'm going to be speaking today about education as anti-authoritarianism. I'm going to begin by describing a debate about education, which is currently taking place in the United States. It is not a new debate in the US context. And I think it is a debate that has also taken place in many other parts of the world and may resonate with some of your experience here in Turkey as well. On one side of this debate, is a group of people who believe that education is vocational training. That the function of education is to prepare people to go out into the workforce. Often they describe this as serving certain profit centers in the global capitalist economy. Sometimes the more humane expression of what they talk about is education as offsetting some of the massive social and political disruptions caused by the global capitalist economy. In the United States, that narrative also often takes the form of coal miners becoming computer programmers. That's one side of the debate. On the other side of this debate is a group who tend to defend the humanities, the study of literature and philosophy, but they often defend this in a very narrow way. They understand there to be a fixed canon of works, which they often refer to as great books with a capital G and a capital B. And what they think is important about these works is that they prepare people for democratic citizenship as they understand it. Uh, uh, what is unspoken, the unspoken assumptions of this particular view of education though, are one, that the advocates want to create a kind of homogenous monoculture that disregards much of the diversity of American society and instead identifies American society with a particular set of texts, a particular set of authors, and a particular set of ideas. Another often unspoken assumption that this group makes is the idea that human nature is fixed. Human nature is perennial, eternal unchanging, immutable. And so the goal of these texts is to try to instruct students in the unchanging elements of human nature. So this first group, uh, the group that believes that education is largely associated with career preparation, a more vocational approach to education or training, uh, tends to be associated with the Democratic Party, the center of left in the United States, um, uh, and I will call this group the technocrats, and I will call their approach to education technocratic. The second group that I just spoke of tends to be associated with conservatives in the United States, the Republican Party, and I'll call this group the medievalists, 
Uh, the reason for that is uh, that this group is largely uh, associated with the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. Their conception of human nature is largely rooted in Aquinas's work. What I want to try to convince you of today is that these two sides of this debate actually share a great deal in common. That they actually both are expressions of what John Dewey called authoritarian education. Namely, the idea that education has a fixed starting point and a fixed end point. And against this, I want to try to propose a third way. An understanding of education which is focused not on fixed goals, uh, not on simply uh, preparing people for society as it is for the status quo, but instead is about giving students the opportunity, the space to create, to be free, to develop their own ideas and opinions and perspectives. And this is the approach to education that I think you are taking here at Sabanji, and this is the approach to education that we are striving to take at Columbia University as well. The idea that we are not instrumentalizing students, we are not simply preparing students uh, to be cogs in the economy, uh, or simply to have a fixed notion of what it is to be a citizen in society, but that we are instead giving students the space to experiment with ideas and to develop their own perspectives on the world. This is a version of education which is not deterministic. It does not view students as simply economic agents or simply uh, participants in a society that has prescribed duties and possibilities, but instead prepares students for a society or enables them to participate in a society in which uh, they actually can define what it means to be a part of that society, in which they don't replicate the past but transform their society and imagine a new future. So that's the vision of education that I'd like to present today. And I'm going to do that by talking about two philosophers whose work I think gives us a vision of this anti-authoritarian form of education. The first is a contemporary French philosopher named Jacques Rancière. And the second is the American philosopher I just alluded to a short while ago, John Dewey. And so what I'm going to do for part of my talk today is to sketch out their visions of education. And then from there, I would like to say a little bit more about what their visions of education mean for us practically, what an anti-authoritarian education actually looks like in practice. And then I will end by talking a little bit about some of the social implications of this form of education. So we will begin then in 19th century France. And uh, to talk about Jacques Rancière's philosophy of education is to talk about an educator named Joseph Jacoteau. Uh, Jacoteau was born in 1770, he died in 1840. He participated in the French Revolution when he was 19 years old in 1789, and he spent his life as an educator. Rancière in 1986 wrote a book about Jacoteau. It's called The Ignorant Schoolmaster. I have a copy of it here, Five Lessons in Intellectual Emancipation. And in this book, Rossier describes Jacoteau's methods and elaborates on them, developing his own vision of education. Rossier wrote this book for two reasons. Uh, first, Jacques Rancière was a student of another French philosopher named Louis Althusser. Some of you may have heard of Althusser. Althusser was a Marxist. And Althusser believed that the great problem that was facing workers and oppressed people was their ignorance. And what was needed was an enlightened teacher who could liberate them from their ignorance and thus show them the way to emancipation. Jacques Rancière, in his youth, subscribed to this view as well when he was a student of Althusser. He actually wrote a book with Althusser called Reading Capital, which was published in 1965. 
But eventually, Rossier breaks with this view. He decides that this is just another version of Plato's philosopher king. Those of you who might have read Plato's Republic know that one of the ideas suggested in this work by Socrates, the central character in Plato's dialogues, is the idea of a society that is dictated or dominated by a philosopher figure. It's the association of knowledge or intelligence with political power. So Jacques Rancière decides that even though Althusser is concerned with the liberation of the workers, that Althusser is still uh, operating under this paradigm of the enlightened philosopher who will liberate the benighted masses. Rossier thinks that this idea is fundamentally undemocratic. So Rossier writes this book in part to try to offer a different vision of education, one that is not associated with authoritative figures trying to liberate the united masses, but is instead rooted in egalitarianism, in a notion of equality. The second reason that Rossier writes this book is that Rossier becomes very interested in philosophy, not as the pursuit of esoteric knowledge or truth, which is how many people tend to think of philosophy, but rather as one of the tools that we have available to us to criticize our society. Philosophy gives us some of the tools that we need to understand the history of our institutions, to identify their flaws, and to develop conceptual responses to the various political practices and institutions that we live with in our society. And so in the 1980s, when Rossier is writing his book, The Ignorant Schoolmaster, he is entering into a debate about education in France. And that education was almost identical, that debate rather, was almost identical to the one that I described a few moments ago taking place today in the United States. On one side, you had a group of people who talked about education strictly in terms of vocational training. Don't worry about culture. Don't worry about the formation of the entire person. Focus only on job skills and nothing more. On the other side, you had a group of people who were saying, no, the purpose of education is assimilation, it is to bring everybody in France, and remember France at this time is becoming an increasingly diverse country, make everyone part of a homogenous monoculture, instill French culture and French values uh, in everyone. Rossier's intervention is trying to find a third way, trying to find another version of education. And he does this by talking about Joseph Jacoteau. So let me say a few words about Joseph Jacoteau, the hero of Jacques Rancière's book. Uh, Jacques Coteau, as I said, served in the French Revolution in 1789 when he was 19 years old. And after that, Jacques Coteau was a teacher. He taught languages, he taught mathematics at the university level, and he took very seriously for his entire life the principles of the French Revolution, liberté, fraternité, and perhaps most importantly, égalité, equality. But it wasn't until 1818, when Jacques Coteau was 48 years old, that he understood what it meant to practice equality in education. At that time, Jacques Coteau was living in exile in Belgium. He was teaching at the University of Louvain. He didn't know the language, and his students didn't know his language. What was he to do? What Jacques Coteau ultimately resorted to was obtaining a um, bilingual copy of a novel called uh, Telemach. Um, this is by Francois Fenelon. Uh, and this is a novel which is based on the story of Telemachus, the son of Odysseus. And uh, Jacques Coteau had obtained a, a bilingual edition of this. And he gave this to his students. And rather than telling his students what they should know or instilling information or transmitting knowledge to them, he simply gave the book to his students and he said, read. Read in each language. Read what you know and read what you don't know and make comparisons. 
Jaco Toe's only instruction was to offer three questions to his students. What do you see? What do you think? What can you say? And ultimately, Jacques Coteau found that through practice, through experimentation, through collaboration, the students were able to work their way through this novel. They were able to understand a new language. They were able to learn French by doing this. And so Jacques Coteau developed a method which Rancière calls universal teaching. It is the idea that anyone can teach anything, anyone can learn anything. The idea, as Rancière describes it, is that human intellect is fundamentally equal. We all have equal intellectual powers and capabilities. No one is some great uh, genius who stands on the mountain beyond us that we all have this fundamental power. He equates this power with attention. The power of reason is the power to be focused on something that we have in common, a text, a project, an idea. And that if we are attentive to what we are looking at, to what we are observing, if we are attentive to what we think about it, if we are attentive to what we say about it, and perhaps most importantly, we are attentive to what others say about it. We can teach and learn ourselves as an egalitarian community. Part of what Ranciere is very interested in here, as I said, Ranciere began as a student of Althusser, a Marxist, and Ranciere has never fully given up Marxism. So part of what Rossier is concerned with here also is division of labor. The idea that there are certain human pursuits, intellectual pursuits that use one part of the mind, one form of reason versus other human pursuits, say manual labor, that either doesn't, don't use the mind uh, or simply use another part of the mind. Rossier collapses this distinction. He says, on the contrary, all human arts, all human pursuits utilize the same fundamental rational and intellectual power of attention. There is no ontological distinction between intellectual labor and manual labor, that they all emerge from the same human powers of reason, intellect, and attention, the same powers uh, that all of us possess in equal measure, in equal share. Uh, this was what uh, Jacques Coteau called uh, panicastic uh, uh, philosophy, the idea of everything in everything. In other words, whether we read a book, whether we build something, whether we design something, we're using the same intellectual power. And therefore, unlike the technocrats, and unlike the medievalists, Jacques Coteau and Ranciere believed that anything could become the starting point for education. We can begin anywhere and we can go anywhere because we are fundamentally using the same powers. Now, of course, you'll say to me, well, uh, Jackson, uh, there, there are uh, clearly people who perform better than other people. Yes, no doubt. That performance, though, Ranciere argues, is based not on innate differences in our powers and abilities, but simply differences in performance and, importantly, opportunity. And so education must give students the opportunity to utilize that power that they have in whatever way it can be manifest whether it is through philosophy or literature or through the sciences or politics or languages, the same human egalitarian power is being manifest in all of those ways. So just to say a word more about Ranciere before I move on to uh, Dewey. Ranciere, I think very importantly, naturalizes learning. I think that that's a crucial element of what he's describing here. The paradigm for learning for 
education for Ranciere and for Jacques Coteau is the acquisition of language by the child. Okay? The child repeats, the child imitates, and the child through that kind of practice is ultimately able to develop their language. And Rossier believes that that also is the fundamental model for education. Uh, it is like the child acquiring their first language. Against this, Rossier describes the explicator or the task of the explicator, explication as a form of stultification. That the moment uh, the authoritative educator is explaining to people what they should know, that the educator is in fact stultifying uh, the student rather than giving them the freedom to develop on their own. I will uh, move on then to my discussion of Dewey and his related ideas about education. So as I mentioned, the two philosophers that I'm relying on today are philosophers who emerged from very different contexts. Uh, Jacques Ranciere, whom I've just described, a contemporary French philosopher, and John Dewey, whom I'll talk about now, an American philosopher from the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, Dewey was born, I believe, in 1859 and died in 1952. And Dewey was probably the most important figure in uh, the American philosophical movement known as pragmatism. Uh, pragmatism was the idea that ideas develop socially in a particular social context cooperatively, and that the test of an idea is our ability to use it to solve problems, our ability to use it to adapt to and cope with our reality. So pragmatists tend not to talk so much about capital T truth. They're not trying to understand the world as it is. They are instead saying that we as human beings develop certain tools which we utilize to solve the problems that we face in the world. So to give a couple of examples of this, science. Science is one of these tools. Science is a fantastic tool for solving all sorts of problems, illness, for instance, we have vaccines, we have antibiotics, right? We can solve the problems that we confront in the natural world for science, uh, through science. Science is not necessarily the best tool though for solving the other kinds of problems that we as human beings tend to have. Problems like, what should I do with my life? What is all of this about? What is the meaning of my life? Problems of mourning, of grief, of working through pain, right? For those sorts of problems, we have developed lots of other kinds of tools. Those tools include things like religion, art, philosophy. These are all ways of trying to grapple with the problems of our lives. And the test of how good these tools are will be their practical application, will be whether or not they solve the problems that we have in life. So that's Dewey's pragmatism. An important part of Dewey's pragmatism then was dispensing again, as I described with Ranciere, with the older models of what philosophy is. Philosophy is not the pursuit of esoteric knowledge and truth. Philosophy is about trying to solve certain problems in the world. And so Dewey thought that philosophers should write about the problems that they face in the world. And one of the things that Dewey was very concerned with I think the fundamental question that Dewey was concerned with was democracy. He thought that rather than philosopher kings, uh, philosophers should be servants of democracy, that we should be trying to find ways to uh, develop better systems of cooperation, which is ultimately what Dewey thought democracy was. Dewey was also very concerned relatedly with education. And he had a number of practical interventions in the world of education throughout the course of his lifetime. Um, he wrote a number of texts about education, two of which I will be referring to. 
One is Democracy and Education. Uh, this is probably one of Dewey's most famous books, a uh, book that he wrote, published in 1916. And uh, 22 years later, in 1938, Dewey published a slim volume called Experience and Education. But Dewey's intervention into education went beyond simply the books that he published. In 1896, when he was still a professor at the University of Chicago, Dewey uh, was part of the creation of a school called the Laboratory School, which still exists today. And as you might guess from the title, part of the goal was to try to develop uh, experimental methods of education to test these ideas out. Um, and later in 1919, Dewey was associated with two projects, which are both very close to me and my own life. One of them was the founding of the New School for Social Research in New York City uh, University, where I got my PhD in philosophy. And also, he was very involved with the creation of the Columbia Core Curriculum that same year in 1919. And that is the program that I oversee now at, uh, at Columbia. So Dewey's interventions in education and in politics go beyond simply a theoretical perspective and actually get involved in the hands-on, the practical. So what was Dewey's vision of education then? Dewey's vision of education begins with experience. It begins with the idea of experience. Um, for Dewey, experience is growth. All of us as living beings find ourselves in particular scenarios, particular situations, where we have uh, specific stimuli and we respond to those stimuli. And through those responses, we adapt, we grow, we learn, and ultimately we communicate, right? The child touches something that is too hot and the child learns not to touch it again. And they communicate their needs by crying, right? So experience is growth, it is dynamic, it is adaptation, it is learning through communication and through experimentation. Education then has to be consistent with experience, Jimmy Hardy. Education cannot be something that is cut off from our experience as human beings. And for Dewey, the two camps that I described earlier, those who think that education is only about career preparation and those who think that education is only about the transmission of a cultural heritage fail to articulate a version of education which is, which is continuous with our experience. Education must allow us to experiment, to pursue hypotheses, to test those hypotheses. And so the role of the educator, again, as with Ranciere, is not to transmit their knowledge and expertise to the student, but rather to create the situation, the context in which students can develop their own creative ideas and their own uh, creative solutions to problems through experiments. This means critically that education has to be very engaged with students' lives and identities. Education can't be something abstract that exists outside of our world. You don't walk into a classroom and simply leave your biography, your history, your identity, your beliefs at the door. You bring them with you, and that's a good thing. Dewey thinks that we should engage with all of those elements of students' lives. We should make what we are learning in school relevant to students' experiences, not to serve the past, not to replicate the past, but to build on the past, to find the possibilities that are inherent in the past. Similarly, Dewey doesn't believe that education is merely abstract preparation for some far off future, which is exactly what the two camps of authoritarian education believe. Education is preparation for a job. Education is preparation for living in society. Dewey believes that education is practicing the same dynamic growth that we experience in all of the other parts of our lives. Education, therefore, is not preparation for anything. Education is uh, a controlled space 
in which the same dynamism, the same experimentation, the same growth that we experience every day in our lives, in everything that we do, is taking place, albeit in a more contained and more controlled way. So think of education then as a kind of laboratory, as a kind of lab experiment. That what the scientist does in the laboratory is not cut off from nature. The scientist simply creates cold, uh, controlled conditions in which to observe what is happening in nature. Education for Dewey is the same thing. That it's creating that controlled environment in which students can collaboratively participate in these processes of stimulation and growth. I want to talk then about just um, in, in concluding on, on Dewey's ideas before saying a little bit more about uh, what anti-authoritarian education might look like today and what its implications for society might be. I just want to draw out three more points from Dewey's work. Um, the first is the importance of play in Dewey's work. Um, pragmatism, Dewey's school of philosophy, really emerges out of romanticism. And in the 19th century, there was a romantic philosopher named Friedrich Schiller who talked about the importance of what he called the play drive. Uh, and the idea is that Schiller was concerned with how we go from being natural beings who simply exist in the world on the basis of our instincts, who simply respond to stimulus in the world. How do we go from that, essentially being very much like animals, right, to becoming free moral beings who can think consciously about our choices? And Schiller thought that the interim stage was play, that it was creative play. It was through aesthetic play, the creation of art, writing poetry and so forth, that that was ultimately how we become free rational beings. Dewey, I think, also takes this idea of play very seriously. Only for Dewey, it's not simply transition to anything. It's not an interim stage for Dewey. For Dewey, play is very important that being able to try out different ways of living, being able to try out different ideas, different theories, different hypotheses, that this is crucial to how we live our lives and that this is going to be crucial therefore to education as well. Um, we need to be free to explore, to engage in what John Stuart Mill called experiments in living. Uh, that that is going to be part of our lives. And Dewey thinks that if we can sustain that through our lives, then we have a lifetime of education. And we also have a democratic life. This is what Dewey means by democracy as a way of life. So that's the, the first point I just wanted to draw out of Dewey's philosophy, the importance of play. Related to this second point is the importance of science. And I've already suggested this a little bit, the idea that education is about experimentation, it's about testing hypotheses, right? Dewey thinks that science gives us a great example of how a community together can create knowledge. We come together in the sciences and we work together to propose ideas and to test out those ideas. And we have a community then that is working collaboratively to develop uh, ideas and to create knowledge. So it's not play for or experimentation for Dewey off in isolation somewhere. It's play and experimentation always in the context of a social cooperative community. That's the second. The third point that I wanted to draw out of, of Dewey, and this is another idea that comes from romanticism is the idea of, of what we call perfectibility. And perfectibility is an idea which goes back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century, and is the, simply the idea that human nature is not fixed. There is no set human nature. Human nature changes, it evolves over time. And so for Dewey, Dewey I think builds on this idea of perfectibility. This play, these experiments that we conduct through education, they're not simply about discovering ourselves. They're not simply about learning 
what other people have known who have come before us. They're not simply about preparing us for the status quo. That part of what we are doing through education is exploring and creating new dimensions of what it is to be human. That we are creating new ways of being human. So I think literature gives us a great picture of this. If any of you have ever read the Iliad, uh, and we could choose any number of literary works, I think, that demonstrate this. I hope that when you uh, read about a figure like Achilles, you don't identify very much with him. Um, Achilles is a very violent person. Achilles' uh, only sense of revenge, uh, of justice is revenge. Uh, and then at the end, we get a little glimpse of pity with Achilles. We see the evolution of, of, of Achilles as someone who can offer pity, right? I think that literature gives us a picture of the ways in which human beings have discovered and created new dimensions of what it is to be human. That I think this is part of the importance of reading literature and reading as much literature as possible and reading as widely as possible is that we gain insights into humanity and the ways in which humanity is constantly changing. I would like to think that we as human beings have become more sensitive, more compassionate, that we have developed a profounder sense of justice, a greater sense of moral imagination, and that these things can be understood and tracked in part through the study of literature and philosophy. So, um, those are, that's the, the sketch that I wanted to offer of, um, of Dewey. Before saying a little bit more of, um, I, I want to just talk about three more things before wrapping here. Um, the first is just to say a little bit more about what I think this could look like in practice today, trying to just add a little more flesh to what Dewey and Rossier have talked about. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about expertise, because I think one of the questions that the forms of education that I'm talking about here can raise is, well, what about expertise? Don't we need expertise? Don't we need experts? And isn't this idea of equality and egalitarianism and anti-authoritarianism uh, uh, anti-expertise uh, in some way? And then I'll close by just saying a word or two about what this might mean um, socially. So I think that when I think about the, the kinds of educational principles that Dewey and Rossier give us when we think about a kind of anti-authoritarian uh, approach to education. I think that one of the, the fundamental underlying principles of, of that kind of education will be pluralism. And what I mean pluralism in a number of senses. First, I think disciplinary pluralism. This is what we often associate with a liberal arts education, right? That if, well, education ultimately is about the free development of individuals collaboratively in community with one another, um, then it means that we have to expose students to as many disciplines, as many perspectives, as many kinds of experiences as possible. This is exactly what I think the, the core curriculum at Spongy is doing and the core curriculum at Columbia is doing as well. Right? We are trying to expose students to many different ways of understanding the world, many different ways of looking at the world, to use Dewey's pragmatist language, many different tools that we have for solving many different types of problems. The idea is not that you become an expert in all of those areas. The idea is that you understand uh, some of the ways in which people have approached the world and understood the world, uh, and that you also have the opportunity to discover the kinds of things that you love and care about and want to do. So you are not simply determined, not predetermined by anything. That's one sense of pluralism. Another sense of pluralism is what I just described. Uh, reading as many perspectives, learning as many experiences as possible, and part of the goal of that, I think, is to foster our moral imagination. Right? That if knowledge is ultimately about collaboration, if it is ultimately about creating communities in which we can work together to solve problems, well, then we need to work together to try to create those communities, right? How do we do that? Well, we don't do it through abstract contracts. Right? 
We don't do it simply by getting together and say, okay, I'll do this for you and you do this for me, right? What makes us work together, what makes us collaborate is that we care about one another. It's that we have concern for one another. And so the development of community, the growth of community is ultimately about expanding our circles of care, going beyond simply the family, the tribe, the hometown, the nation state, right? Actually expanding, widening those concentric circles of care so that we might work together and we might collaborate together. And ultimately that is how knowledge advances and it is also how democracy develops and how democracy advances. Democracy is the expansion of those circles of care. And therefore, an incredibly important part of education is going to be getting us to be invested in the lives of other people, people who are very different from us, people who look different from us, people who have different values, different beliefs, different religions, different nationalities, different ethnicities. That is also going to be a crucial part of the anti-authoritarian education that I'm describing here. Beyond this, as, uh, as, as you, I've already touched on these things, uh, this kind of anti-authoritarian education will always be active, uh, meaning it's going to be focused on problem solving, developing projects, uh, it's not going to be sitting back as all of you are right now, listening to someone drone on and on and on, right? It's actually going to be actively engaged in conversation, uh, actually sharing your perspectives, your opinions and ideas. I think it has to have an experimental component. Again, experimentation, not only with uh, what we might do in a laboratory with science, but actually experimenting with the ideas that we take on trying to see perspectives very different from our own, trying to live in new ways, right? Experimenting with what it might be to live differently from how we have lived before. Um, and then finally, anti-authoritarian education will always be collaborative as well. And again, I think that these are the elements, the finest elements of a liberal arts education. Um, so having sketched that out a little bit, you know, I've been talking about equality, I've been talking about anti-authoritarianism. This does raise an important problem, which is the problem of expertise. What about experts? Don't we need experts? Where would we be in the world without experts? Is there a place for experts and expertise in this conception of education that I'm trying to describe here? And uh, I'll just say, I flew from New York City to Istanbul maybe three days ago. I, I'm very foggy, I've lost, lost track of time and the days. Uh, when I was on that plane for 10 hours or more, right, uh, I wanted to know that everybody involved in designing, building, maintaining, cleaning, flying that plane was an expert. Right? My, my life depended on their expertise. This is not to take a position against expertise. Uh, at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that I am trained as a philosopher. Right? Uh, training is what we might associate with expertise. When I say I'm trained as a philosopher, I mean that I learned specific methods that are utilized by philosophers, that I did learn a body of knowledge that is associated with philosophy, right? But that training took place in a much broader experience of education. And this is what I'm trying to describe. I'm trying to describe a version of expertise, of, of, of education that of course leaves space for expertise but also provides students with certain tools, certain characteristics, certain traits that can also be useful in offsetting specifically two problems that we might associate with expertise. Expertise is a very good thing. We need it in our modern world. Uh, but like all good things, there are a couple of downsides to expertise. And I just want to touch on two of those downsides and talk about why I think anti-authoritarian education is so important then in a world that is dominated by experts and in a world where we need expertise. The first problem that I want to talk about is what I call the old guard, right? Uh, there's the old guard. Now, this is a phrase we use, uh, meaning the people who know everything. They're well established, right? They're in positions of power. And one of the things that we see 
One of the problems that we have seen in history is that the old guard sometimes is unable to recognize valuable criticism or critique and valuable innovation, right? Often the old guard critiques the new generation, right? Uh, Thomas Kuhn in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, talks about how this plays out in the history of science, uh, but you can see it in the history of the arts, right? One generation hears the music of a new generation and says, what is that noise, right? It's genius that you're hearing, right? It's innovation that you're hearing. But the old guard sometimes can't recognize the innovations of a new generation, right? And so an anti-authoritarian education gives us an appreciation for our own intellectual powers but it also gives us a measure of humility, an ability to appreciate the intellectual powers of others. To say that though I have become an expert in my field, I am open to the innovative, critical new ways of looking at the world that a new generation is proposing. So that is one version of uh, the problem of expertise and the way in which an anti-authoritarian education can address it. The second problem that I wanna talk about is what I call the talking lion problem. Uh, this comes from Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations, uh, section 327, I think it is, of the investigations. It's simply one line and it's this. Wittgenstein writes, if a lion could talk, we would not understand it. If a lion could talk, we would not understand it. What on earth does Wittgenstein mean? Uh, for Wittgenstein, Language is about community. Language is about a form of life, right? And so when we speak a language, when we become competent in a language, it means that we have become part of a community, that we share in a community's practices and a community's form of life. And so the reason why Wittgenstein thinks that we couldn't understand the talking lion is because we don't live like lions. We don't live with lions. We don't understand how they live. We don't share their concerns, their problems, their needs, their desires. I do like to nap all day, but you know, other than that, I don't share any of the practices, the needs, or the concerns of a lion. Right? Uh, this is another problem that we get with expertise sometimes. And I can only speak to my own context in the United States, but one of the problems that we are facing in the United States today is that experts and non-experts cannot talk to each other. In the United States, we talk about the East Coast and the West Coast uh, being these places where there are well-educated elites. And in between, it, people sometimes refer to it as flyover country, right? When you're flying from New York City to Los Angeles, you fly over all of those other states, right? This is the way people sometimes talk in the United States about their fellow Americans about other people, right? The talking lion is what happens when the educated can't listen to, understand, or speak with those who don't share their education and their expertise, right? And it has drastic consequences, deadly consequences. I don't know what was happening in Turkey during the pandemic, but I can tell you that in the United States, vaccines, of course, were developed fairly quickly, much more quickly than had ever happened in a pandemic uh, previously. But many Americans refused to take the vaccine because they didn't trust the medical establishment that developed those vaccines. The response of some people who believe in science, who believe in medicine, was, ah, those people are idiots. They don't know anything, right? Many of those people though, I'm not saying that this accounts for all resistance to vaccines. Many of those people live in communities today that are being decimated by an opioid epidemic, addiction to heroin, but also prescription painkillers that were given to people irresponsibly by the medical establishment. That doesn't justify rejecting vaccines, but it explains why people might feel distrustful of the medical establishment, why they might feel alienated from the medical establishment. 
And what's required then of educated people is not to go into those communities and look down on them and call them idiots and lecture them and tell them everything they've gotten wrong. What's required of the experts is to go and listen, listen well, listen carefully, hear where people are coming from. I'm not trying to eliminate expertise. I'm trying to democratize it. Everyone is an expert in something. If nothing else, every one of you, every one of us is an expert in our own lives and our own experiences. And if the educated experts don't listen to people when they talk about their experiences and their lives and their pain, the consequences are deadly. So what I hope I have convinced you of is that the anti-authoritarian education that I'm describing, which is focused on freedom, which is focused on equality, is not a repudiation of expertise. It is uh, instead making expertise more effective, making expertise, uh, making experts better able to share their expertise with others. So I'll just close by saying a little bit more then about what this might mean socially, some of the social political implications of this. And I'll be talking about this in greater depth tomorrow when I talk about John Dewey and democracy. Um, but what I wanna say for now is simply this. Uh, John Dewey was a philosopher of democracy and he was very interested also in the idea of liberalism. Uh, liberalism often going together with how we talk about democracy, right? Liberal democracy being the phrase that we use. Dewey was calling for, though, a renewed liberalism. Uh, in the 1930s, he wrote a very important book called Liberalism and Social Action, probably my favorite of his books. And in Liberalism and Social Action, Dewey calls for a radical liberalism that preserves all of the values of liber liberalism, the defense of individual liberty, the recognition of the need to develop everybody's individual potential and the importance of the free expression of thought and ideas, right? But Dewey goes a step further and he says, one of the problems with liberalism is that liberalism has not thought through what kinds of institutions we need to preserve those values, to defend liberty, to ensure that individuals are able to realize their potential and to ensure that individuals can speak freely and develop their ideas and share those ideas with others. Right? And so Dewey in the end calls for people to come together as a community to renew their institutions and imagine a society and a set of institutions that will preserve those values, that will foster those values in people and in communities. And I think that that is exactly what Sabanji University is doing today. I think that this is exactly the kind of institution that Dewey was talking about, that is fostering and protecting those very important liberal values. And I think the challenge that all of you will be faced with and the challenge that I am faced with and that uh, my, uh, my fellow citizens are faced with is how do we take this forward? How do we take it outward? How do we expand what is happening in this community and ensure that others are able to be a part of it. So I will close there. Thank you so much. If there are any questions or comments, I would love to hear from all of you. I've been talking way too much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Jeffrey, you have three questions. Okay. I have to moderate. Yeah, sure. No? So, yes, please. Perfect. Thank you. I have the energy and I have to close. your students. Thank you very much. Mm. Saying that college students, most college students are under the heavy burden of loans yes. now. Yes. And students they graduate trying to pay off their debts yeah. and being part of the system. Mm -hmm. so how do you solve this problem? Yeah. That's that challenge I ended with, right? So, for those of you who didn't hear, um, the question was, uh, Education is very expensive. It creates these burdens on students. Uh, people spend their lives paying off their educational debt. I'm still, I'm very old. Uh, I'm still paying off my debts from, from my education, right? So of course this discourages people. Oh yes, oh yes. I don't want to tell you how much educational debt I have, right? So this discourages people from pursuing education. It does 
push people into that more vocational approach to education. People want something very practical, right? This is the challenge, one of the challenges that I was talking about at the end. I mean, I want to be very clear. Uh, the the anti-authoritarian education and the idea of a radical liberalism that reuse and transforms our institutions, this is not all truth and beauty. That this is also about engaging critically with the material realities in which education takes place. And we have to be attentive to the market mentalities, to the profit mentality when it enters into education. I don't have the solution to that, but we have to think about that. We have to think about the place of people from minority groups who historically might have been uh, uh, blocked from pursuing an education, might have been excluded from an education, right? We, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I think that these are the kinds of, of institutional questions that we have to address if we are to take this vision of education seriously. Um, and uh, it means that we have to be very engaged with our political institutions. And it means that I think we have to follow Dewey's advice also and experiment, that we need educational experiments, we need institutional experiments. It's not going to be one solution to all of our problems. It's going to require uh, that we work experimentally in a number of different areas in our society. Yes. You mentioned that ed education is space for experiments. Yes, right? yeah. But what if people don't have a demand for experiments? Like, yeah. Isn't it the solution given them uh, basic education to make them available or achieve, achieve the fundamental abilities to experiment with different ideas. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not sure if I, I fully understand what the, the challenge is there, that you know, the student might not feel the need to experiment or the student might not have the, the space in which to experiment or the time in which to experiment or? The need for not to have a motivation. Ah, the motivation. Okay, good, good. So yeah, what if there isn't the motivation for experimentation? Excellent question, right? Uh, I mean, this is where we do get into some truth and beauty, right? You need a little bit of inspiration, I think, in education. Um, uh, Gerto said, um, teaching does much, uh, inspiration does all, right? So, I mean, I think that, that part of what we have to do as educators is to try to inspire our students, to get them to think. This is why it's so important to try to reach students where they are, to speak to their lives and their experiences and their biographies and their cares. Let students uh, come to the educator and tell the educator, these are the things that I care about. This is what matters to me. We all have our cares and our concerns. Um, and finding ways to work that into an educational program so that they have the opportunity for experimentation. I'll just give, I wanna give actually a couple of examples, uh, concrete examples of, of what I've been talking about. Um, one, uh, I have a, a student who uh, just graduated, who uh, was a pre-med student, she's about to go to medical school, but she also was an English major because she loved literature. And she spent a summer looking at the language that was being used by those people who were hesitant to be vaccinated during the pandemic. She spent an entire summer reading what they wrote, what they said online, and analyzing and trying to understand where they were coming from, right? That was something that mattered to her and that she cared about. And it was a literary project that she was working on that spoke to her experience, her interests, her cares, her ambition to be a doctor. And it took seriously the perspectives of people that again, all too often were being dismissed as stupid, as being idiots. Um, so that's an example of what I'm talking about. I also, I asked my students at the end of, of this year, I, this past year was teaching a course at Columbia called Contemporary Civilization. Um, this is a study of thousands of years of moral and political philosophy. And at the end, I asked my students to give me a proposal for how they would change this course. If they were given full authority to just transform it from beginning to end, what would they do differently? And one of the things that they said they would do differently is that they would require all students to adopt an idea for a month at the end of the year and try to live according to that idea. 
Um, but again, the students would be able to choose the idea themselves. They would be able to figure out what, how they wanted to experiment, what the experiment was that they wanted to participate in. And this is exactly, if you haven't read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, please go out and read it. Chapter three, John Stuart Mill talks about these experiments in living and that this he thinks is the essence of liberal democracy. It's not being able to vote every year for the lesser of two evils. Uh, it's being able to live this kind of life. Emery, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, I was thinking uh, like every educational system is very much goal oriented. Yeah. And in your lecture, there were these two uh, prototypes, if you were yeah. of the leaflets, the necrophrats. Yeah. When you adopt one of the other, it's very easy to set goals. Yeah. Uh, especially for the necrophrats, because it's very much skills oriented, job oriented, yeah. but also for classic texts. Yes, exactly. But your suggested third way, inspired by the examples that you discussed, made me feel like it's very hard to set goals for that. Uh, right, it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> to Columbia, the Columbia would say, let me see the transcripts. <laughs> right, right. So, Quantifiable things are very hard to justify. Yes, yes, and yes. yes. Yeah. Maybe not years ago, but these days. Yeah. That was what I kept thinking when you were talking. About it. <laughs> right. I can feel the power of personal emancipation and enlightenment, and this happening better in this scenario than the others. Yes. But I cannot, in my mind, convince the upper men. <laughs> right. Yes. So I mean, this this again gets to this problem: How do we rethink our institutions to allow space for this? Now, you know, as I said, with training for expertise, I don't think that this model of education that I'm trying to describe, this anti-authoritarian approach, um, is uh, has to exist entirely on its own. I'm not trying to argue for the hegemony of this approach. I think that we can find ways as educators to situate it in our context and in other situations through the kinds of projects that I was just describing a moment ago, that we create spaces for it. We don't have to entirely give up on grades and attendance policies and all of those other kinds of things, learning outcomes, all of those quantifiable goals. I think actually those things can be very good. But I think that if we bring this anti-authoritarian mindset into some of the work that we do as educators, and if we try to base at least some of our approaches and some of our problems, uh, some of our projects rather, around this kind of approach, um, then I think we create spaces within the university experience in which students are not simply thinking about how they can best prepare for the status quo, whether it be the economic status quo, the vocational technocrat model, or the political status quo, trying to be uh, a citizen as defined currently by my society, right? That we try to create spaces in our classrooms and beyond, right? On campus, various places, in parks, right? Where people can experiment with ideas through dialogue, through forming community, um, and, and different, different ways of living. And I, so, so I, I'm not, saying throw everything out. I'm, I'm not being a revolutionary here, um, but I'm saying let's try to work this kind of approach into what we are doing as educators. Yes? Question uh, regarding what will happen if our students or the majority of the people do not have that motivation. Yeah. But we rightly criticize some Platonic views, and I believe a good answer comes from Plato's student, Aristotle, the famous mm -hmm. first sentence from his metaphysics. Mm -hmm. There, his argument is that all people, by nature, desire to know, yeah. to know, to think, yeah. to philosophize, other than yeah. to translate the term. Now, even the ancients, yes, they were searching for the philosopher king. Mm -hmm. but philosophically, mm -hmm. they would agree with him. Yeah, they I agree. They that yeah. as a potentiality yeah. all beings, we humans, yes. we want to know. But yeah. they were aware that not all their students have the privilege. Mm -hmm. exactly. exactly. So I believe uh, something is happening in between. And now I'm thinking about my students, first year students, and also the generation. We see that they are not, they do not follow that motivation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I do think that Aristotle is right. My son is now three years old. 
that she was like, no, what I'm thinking. Yes, yeah. <laughs> My daughter is three as well. So I, I know what you're going through. Yes. Yeah. What, uh, yeah. what the element that you could say was is the two elements that you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, the experimentation and mm -hmm. the element of play. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. I think that if we can make them part of our teaching, yeah. I hope that that, that innate. Yes. Yes. I I I agree completely. Thank you for that. And I think it speaks to Emory's point as well uh, that you know we, we have these institutions now in our society which um, are you know, the students who come to Columbia. They have spent their entire lives essentially being formed into these high performance you know academic uh, superstars. And badge collectors often, yes, and you know, they have their activities, their extracurriculars, all of the things that they've been doing, they're very high test scores, they're very high grades, and, and those are achievements. I would not criticize those or take those away from anyone. But I worry, I see among many of them, this stress to conform and to do exactly what is expected of them. And we have to find ways to give them the space to be creative and to pursue what they want to do and what they care about most. And I think if we can give them the space, the motivation will be there. I think it's there, it's buried. Yeah, so just follow on from there, and I have a question that will follow that. I completely agree, and I have yeah. been a teacher who just described herself as someone who hopes to inspire. I don't believe in teaching. I don't think you can teach anything to anyone. It's only, only if you're lucky or skillful enough or both. You can maybe inspire the curiosity for them to find out and learn. Yes. But I think yes. That's the job of a quote unquote teacher. Yeah. Having said that, let's say we have been the greatest institution and we broke the armor and now they're vulnerable. So they're that at that mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. They're ready to play, they're playing, uh, they're experimenting, all is great in this playground. But when you were speaking, you said, uh, we can. We collaborate. And mm -hmm. that was where my mind just got stuck. Because then they're going to graduate. I'm also true to my own child. When we make them that playful and vulnerable and creative and that just let them go out in the world, do we really care? I think mm. it's a moral challenge there. Yeah. I think the world isn't going to a place where we really care about each other. You exemplified it really well when you were saying, well, that fly across country. Oh, yes. Even yeah. A country, yeah. Similarly in mind, we're already quite polarized. So it's, I don't think the world is going to a place where um, people who are like incredibly playful and creative and peaceful and, you know, like wagging their tails and ready to sort of pull them out. <laughs> and right. You know, right. That, that has been the moral challenge on my mind as you were. Although I am all for it. Yeah. <laughs> I no. Think that, I, that's sitting there. Yeah. I think that that is a, an excellent point. And I think, you know, and again, I think a lot of these points connect that uh, this is also something that we have to be mindful of. I mean, I'm also, I'm not simply saying to my students, oh, don't read, don't study. Um, I, uh, you know, I want them also to, I, I'm not trying to send them off into the world without any of, the armor that they are going to need in the world. But I also think that if being human means anything, it's going to mean that power to adapt and that power to create. And that if our education is turning students into high performing machines, ultimately in the short term, that might look good and it might look like we're giving them what they need for the world. I don't think we are. I think that it's in trying to cultivate some of those more human dimensions of the experience that we're ultimately best going to prepare them for the world. Yes. Oh, actually, could we could we hear from you first, and then just since since you spoke already, is that that okay? Yeah. Uh, especially in the US. Yes. Uh, there was this uh, decision that the experimental action in the US. Yes. Columbia is one of them. Which uh, most expensive university in the world. So yes. like, it's one of the most expensive here. here right? yeah. We talk about that in the morning. So where do you think uh, it takes America, considering that you talk about the equality yeah. of 
education equality of accessing education. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's yeah, yeah. Excellent question. So can I hold on responding to that just to hear, just because I think your, your comment or question was in response to this. So I will answer that in a second, equality in the United States in the wake of the decision about affirmative action. I, I feel that to help us, you are also summarizing your own views. Yeah. I just want to underline some very important critical elements. Please. Regarding uh, yeah. Um, the two kinds that we criticize here, one of them is Helen the other. So, the human nature is not fixed. Mm -hmm. It means that it underlines the argument of religion, but the your religion is, you need to challenge it. Later. Now, it's a whole package. The moment you challenge it, you also have this threat. It lose this danger of losing what is right and wrong. Because if I accept the package, I'm happy to and I can follow it. But if I prefer to challenge it, okay, then what is right, what is wrong? And in, in the last decades, the, one of the most important answers that we have regarding what type of ethics to have in the society is it's okay. Yeah. So I do not have a list. However, in our experience, in our technical human relationship, if we attend to each other, if we are careful enough, if we are attentive enough, people know what is right, what is wrong, people emerge in collaboration. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is why that the word you use is so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yes, I, I think that uh, there, there is certainly, I mean, you also, I think, in that comment, raise a very important point about Dewey, which there's a very deep secularism in Dewey's thought. Dewey was uh, raised in a very strict Christian household. He remained a practicing Christian until he was 30. Um, and after that, Dewey really rejects the idea of any, this is what I mean by deep secularism, you know, any sort of final higher authority on anything. That's why you need pluralism, why you need a variety of perspectives. At the same time, figures like Richard Rorty, who's a philosopher who died about 15 years ago and was a great reader of Dewey, have argued that part of what Dewey is doing is secularizing many of the religious teachings that come out of the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. And this idea of care, I think, is a really central one. So, so yeah, thank you for raising that. About affirmative action in the United States. So um, just to provide a little bit of, of context, affirmative action is a program that goes back to the 1960s, and it has allowed institutions to consider race in uh, admissions, in college admissions. This has been a crucial, incredibly important element of making the United States a more democratic society, making it more equal, and allowing opportunities to, to uh, particularly Black Americans, but uh, groups, many different uh, ethnic groups in the United States, to allowing them to have uh, the opportunity to participate in education and uh, in American democracy, something that had been denied to them for centuries. Um, very recently, last month, our, our Supreme Court, which is now extremely conservative, uh, and has been striking down a lot of liberal legislation uh, in the United States, including access to abortion, the Roe v. Wade decision uh, about a year ago, um, our, our Supreme Court struck down affirmative action. So colleges and universities are no longer going to be able to consider race and admissions. So that means we are not going to be able to ensure that we have a very diverse student community. Um, uh, this was a decision that Columbia University was very opposed to. Harvard also uh, was part of this case and had been very opposed to this decision. These universities will be working to find other mechanisms to ensure that there is greater diversity on campus. Uh, there's already a lot of discussion about this, the way in which our admission system is very different from yours, of course, and um, students have to submit an essay when they, they apply directly to schools. Um, one of the things that they do is to provide an essay. Um, the essay used to be kind of inconsequential when it came to the admission decision. I think the, the essay is now going to become incredibly important. That's going to be the place where admissions officers are going to be looking to see what kind of circumstances students come from. What sorts of adversity, what sorts of hardship did they have to grapple with? Uh, you know, did the students simply go to an excellent private school and have a life of privilege, or did the student actually come from a poorer community and 
you know, as, as I was a first generation college student, will they be a first generation college student? Those kinds of considerations I think will still be addressed, but they'll just have to be addressed. I think in, um, it's going to become more of an art than a science uh, moving forward. One of the positive developments that has come out of this is Wesleyan University just within the last day or so ended what, what are called legacy admissions. So many universities have uh, uh, what they call uh, ALDC, um, Athletics, Legacies, Dean's List, Children of Faculty and Staff. And these are groups of applicants that have traditionally gotten special treatment. So um, athletes who might, this is not to say that all athletes at, at schools uh, are, are uh, lower performing as students, but sometimes schools will admit students who are not performing as high. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This has been such a pleasure. I really appreciate it.